but this is where the community gets a chance to ask scary questions of ex-liberals. And luckily, we've got the president here. Yeah, I don't know as much as the, the answers I used to, so uh, you'll have to uh, bear with me. But it's all right, whatever he says, or whatever Bass says. You're going to hold it against me, I can see. Yeah, okay, yeah. all right. All right. If it gets too difficult, we expect them to question things. All right, okay. I can, I can handle that. So, um, so all these questions have been submitted by you guys. In all fairness, we've given it to the Slivers, so they can at least find out what we're asking. And not be caught on the run. So, the first, the first question is ProQuest ebook central integration. Okay, so <laughs> yeah. this is the last one. You don't really want me to read all this, but the end result is you can connect to a device of any size that is successfully implemented with each role, ebook and integration. That's you. Uh, it says, is it working? Yeah. Okay. Did any of the um, uh, people here use this integration? Which university? Which one, sorry? Okay, so Swinburne, um, so you guys raised this issue and I followed up on this one. So uh, you've got a response and I understand that now it's working. Uh, uh, from, from yesterday, I think. Oh. And anyway, there was the <laughs> yeah. the so, yeah. so, so 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 for the for the question if it's working, so yes, it's working. Uh, <laughs> I'm not saying specifically for your institution. I'm saying in general, we have institutions that are using it. The problem specifically that we checked because of this question was about an FTP. URL that was, I don't know, wrong or something like that. As far as I checked just before the session on the case on Salesforce, it is working. Um, so uh, I advise any of you, Charles Stewart, if you have issues with that, come to me after the session, I'll try to help. Uh, but yes, uh, it is working, it should work, and we have institutions that are working successfully with this integration. Hope it comes in. See the advantage of the Q&A session. <laughs> questions? Oh, sorry. Oh, wow. So it's written in the same box, yes? Yes. And what do you use to just go production? Put in the production? Yes. Yes. I've got the email address. Phone number and Facebook. We don't need a Salesforce number. So the next question is. So the next question is for libraries moving to the new Primo UI. Um, is there still people using the old Primo UI? Okay. Yes, uh, will they be able to maintain the ability for local customization? Yes. So, um, yeah. <laughs> you can hear me without the microphone? Yeah, I think you can. We need to Oh, okay. Sorry. Um, so, of course, you can have your own customization with the new Primo UI. Uh, basic knowledge of Angular JS and CSS should do the job. Now, are you familiar with the Primo Studio? Yes. Yes. Perfect. So this is just a good example of the easiness of, of how you can easily customize the new UI. Here is, you can see an example of, uh, this is a real Primo. By the way, uh, so all of you saw this demo? No. no. Okay. So I'll use this opportunity. Just one minute. Okay. <laughs> so here you see a primo. Uh, primo. I don't know how to dance this dance. <laughs> this is what happened when you work at the Commonwealth Games. And, no. <laughs> so this is uh, a primo site, and basically using this add-on or this tool, you can change the colors. And and branding and see how it looks in real time. So if, for example, I change just the color that is an example, I just need to update the theme. I just changed the, uh, the final color. Uh, 
<laughs> Amazing. Now, <laughs> now, this is a real primo site. This is not a mock up or anything. So, I search for this is my Alma demo in one. Um, so, back to the question yes, of course, you can have your own customization. Uh, we also have uh, uh, a vibrant community of developers working together. So, one of the examples here is this one. Here you can see add-ons created by you see, other customers or some uh, few of its Lewis developers we have here as well. Uh, but basically, yes, you can customize it. Yes, we have a community that uh, supports us in this initiative. And yes, we want to see you customizing it and opening your own developments and using your own developments as much as you can. So are there any follow-up questions? Which sense? The Primo Studio. No, 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 this is just a demo. What I just showed you? Yeah, it's not a live um, thing. Um, Primo V should work perfectly with that. Again, that's the best issues. I'm not aware of any issues. No, no, I think there was his specific. Primo Studio is not fully released yet. Okay? It's in a preview mode. We, we share this and we let, I know some people are already wanting to try to, uh, to implement this. It's not in a, a fully released yet. And I think uh, the product manager uh, nearly wrote uh, to, the, to the Primo listserv uh, just the other day about this. So a while ago, a protocol known as Onyx Teal was being developed to ingest license data from vendors in the same way as Sushi does to Yuzi stuff. We are interested in whether any development has been proposed similar to that of Faber and libraries for holding information. Please. So this is me? Oh, no. So this is the truth. <laughs> Near, I think you should take it in personally. I mean, he kind of alluded to that, that That's you're not. But, um, okay, so um, we've we already uh, did couple some work uh, with Onyx PL. I think uh, maybe some of you have experienced uh, the ability to uh, to upload manually uh, Onyx PL file into, into the system. It's true that right now the licensing term is based on IRMI DLF and it's not based on, uh, on Onyx PL, uh, roadmap plans for us is to actually use, uh, you know, Onyx PL as a format for licensing, uh, for license uh, says not just Ermi DLF and that's in the roadmap. I don't have it in front of me when, but we can, we can check on this. So yes, there is a continuous plan to look into uh, this. The other plan in terms of the roadmap for Onyx PL is also use that with APIs to ability to update fields and data for licenses using the APIs following the Onyx uh, PL format. One of the challenges that we have is that it hasn't been yet adopted, widely adopted by the publishers themselves. Okay, so we, it's kind of the chicken and the egg a little bit, you know, we, we are trying to do more in the system, but you know, there's not enough out there, you know, publishers that are actually following and provide their, their data and licensing and stuff in Onyx PL. So, we're trying to do our share of, of putting it into the system as much. Hopefully, publisher will adopt it as well. And then I think it's going to, you know, go, go faster in the industry. Excellent. No follow-up questions? Where is the next level of plans for vendor metadata knowledge base? I feel that the service model offered by serial solutions which provide a seamless integration between holding information and a universal authority based and normalized vendor metadata knowledge base was an example of best practice service delivery. <laughs> Does Xlibris plan to develop a vendor metadata knowledge base based on this model? So is did anyone that asked this question is in the room? Because it wasn't clear to us exactly what does it mean, uh, uh, vendor data. I mean, how different, I mean, yes, there are differences in the way 
you know, 360, uh, you know, database it still is and design versus, you know, Alma communities and other, but it wasn't exactly clear to us what was the, uh, that was asked here that is so different. So, if, okay. Now, I didn't ask the question, but I think it may be coming from the differences between the updates of the knowledge base. I'm just thinking of what was asked at Luna. Okay. So the salmon and cereal solution knowledge base seems to be ahead than the um, community zone knowledge base. Okay. And I think it's that okay. uh, differentiation that, that okay. people are finding challenging. Okay. All right, so, so if this is the, the, the question, so there is, I think you know today that um, the way uh, the Alma Community Zone is relying on updates coming from the SFX, it actually it's, it's based on the SFX knowledge base. So that's why we are still tied to the, uh, the update cycle, the, the weekly update cycle of the SFX knowledge base, and then it's getting populated to, to communities, to the Alma Community Zone. Uh, Yes, we do have plans to change it. We do have plans to move to a to a situation where the Alma Community Zone will be updated directly and not through a, the SFX knowledge base, and that will uh, allow us obviously to also change the the frequency to more you know daily and even more than that, uh, more aligned with some of the changes, uh, more you know real time quicker changes that 360 has. Uh, it also allow, will allow us to do other things. Uh, that you know, right now maybe are some you know traditional, more limited on the the way the SFX knowledge base was built. Uh, Alma doesn't have the knowledge base. The, the case this uh, community zone is uh, has better and rich uh, management of of, of records or of the metadata itself. And obviously, we are very much uh, tied to a lot of things that uh, were a little bit more traditional uh, in a way that was done in SFX. So we do have plans to do this. And changes. This is actually not a future long plan. It's actually something we're starting to, to look at in 2018, and I think in 19 you'll see some some major changes there. Okay. Like shorter. If we can all read this. Yes. Okay. You don't need me to. So I take it news now. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah so. So yes, uh, we have. Can you? Yeah. We have um, plans to have a single point uh, of activation. This is part of Primo V roadmap. So you can imagine that if you manage the activations uh, from Primo VE from within Alma, you can easily uh, also uh, activate the PCI without the need to go out and activate it also in PCI. Uh, yes, we we're going to maintain the option to have collections that are activated only on PCI without the need to have them, like the uh, uh, use case described here. Now, um, Dave, if you can move to the next slide, it's basically the same question. Um, but here it's also about improvement. So, Yes, we have a lot of improvements uh, as part of uh, the main Primo roadmap. Uh, of course, since we are developing Primo VE and going to have a customer profile uh, screen in Primo VE, uh, which is going to be used also for this activation, then we're going to have an improved user interface and so on and so forth. Um, any other things to ask about this one? This is an interesting one. So we thought about the GDPR compliance, but new note. So in Australia, we've got our own laws doing the data breach. So what is Exlibris doing to help institutions understand data breaches and notifications to users in this region as compared to okay. over there? So, so first of all, if you look at, uh, and I hope many of you have heard, uh, we just launched at the end of April um, something we refer to as the Trust Center. If you go to trust at dot .com, you see this is the, the portal that actually aggregates all the information that we have around security, privacy, compliance, and availability. And it really, um, yes, it was built as part of our 
you know, pushing a lot of the work we've done with GDPR. I think you all, if you haven't heard about GDPR, you're probably going to, uh, not, not even, it's not about European, it's uh, everyone here, it's a large investment for both companies and universities and because of the new roles of data privacy in Europe. But it really forced us to, to look across all our products, all our practices, all our procedures and really align them uh, and ensure that uh, that we really follow as much as we can uh, across the board, not just with GDPR, but as you can see, other countries and other regions are following with not necessarily exactly the same, but things in the same manner, uh, such as, uh, you know, having notification, breach notification uh, in the law. Um, actually, Exlibris have had that, and we have, and one of the things you go through, uh, in the trust center, you see our policy for, inc for security incident breach policy that talks about the fact uh, that we, as soon as, as we are aware of, and no later than within 24 hours, we are, uh, our policy is uh, in commitment to uh, provide information about the incident, the breach to our customers. And again, obviously describing, you know, what has taken, what happened, you know, which, uh, you know, which sub which patron or which uh, were affected, uh, what was taken as an action from us as a vendor, and of course, uh, helping uh, in any way of, of notification mandate that you have towards your own uh, patron and, and, and data subjects. So, yes, so this is, so again, if you go to, uh, it's uh, in the privacy or in in uh, in the privacy section. You'll see a link to all our policies. These are again all available, and um, and over there you'll see you'll be able to link into our policy, security policy. This is privacy policy. Uh, uh, no, it's not here. Go to compliance, compliance, compliance. Oh no, compliance, compliance. I'm pretty sure it's in. Com Go down, go, um, go down. No, no, <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. Go down. Okay, it's not, it's not, it's one of those tabs. I don't remember. One of them has, uh, go, go, uh, no, it's the security. Maybe in the security, security. Uh, we tried all of them, right? Sorry, uh, I apologize. Uh, yeah, security policies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and you link to all our policies. One of them you'll see is a very clear commitment that we have go down. Uh, here, exhibit security and privacy incident response policy on the right side. Okay, yeah. And over here you see exactly again our process and commitment to how do we address and how we provide information for uh, incident breaches to our customers and it is following and, and I can say we are looking every, every you know we have a privacy office officer looks around all policies and she made sure also um, we are aware of the new policies and also notification in in uh, this regions and others by the way Israel also have new uh, just lately so we are following them and we make sure that it is aligned and are actually just as an example, uh, in in the GDPR, actually, there's no commitment from the vendor, but the actual universities are required by law to notify within 72 hours. Our policy already has been that we have to do it as soon as we can and within 24 hours, for example. Okay, so actually even better than the GDPR one compliance. And again, this is trying to be more strict to allow, to be better aligned with uh, also other regions as well. Yeah. The so yeah yes we have if there's our instances we will report similar to by the way if you look at uh, also security advisories again if you go back to, you don't have to go back but yes the answer is yes uh, the same this is the place now that has. You know, we, we kind of used to have things all over the place a little bit. So we kind of put them all together. One of them is not just the, the breach notification, but also any security advisories when there's, you know, again, typically uh, issues with, you know, uh, 
uh, patches that needs to be done. Uh, we do it, of course, on our cloud system, but if you have local system and you need to patch the system, all those security advisories are uh, linked from here and the same will is for breach notifications. Luckily, we've never had one, knock on wood, okay? So please, okay, I hope uh, not jinx us. Uh, yeah. So, um, yeah, let's go on to this one. Yeah, I want to show something as well. So I'll split the answer to two parts. One part is to emphasize again um, that we are actively involved in a lot of open access initiative. Um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the, um, where is it, this one? Oh, the, um, the unpay wall, for example, which replaced the, uh, what was it, the um, OA DOI. Um, so we are actively participating in trying to implement all the different uh, aspects of um, open access. Um, and from the product point of view, uh, I have an example here for May release. I tried Swinburne, but uh, I don't know, you, you guys are kind of, uh, not using these facets, or maybe you are, but I couldn't find it. But RMIT, I think, um, have it. So I'll just show you an example. So basically, um, yes, we want to help your users to find open access materials. Uh, and the ways doing that, uh, first of all, these kind of stuff. So you have an indicator saying uh, it's an open access article. Of course, this is also part of the, uh, of the facets. Um, and also, um, we have another question about ranking and boosting. We also want you to have the ability to boost open access collections on behalf of uh, <coughs> not open collections. So um, yeah. Any, any, any other questions about open access? And by the way, Swinburne, is it, is it that I didn't find it or are you guys are not using it on purpose? I'm not using it on purpose. Okay, okay, and that is a slash is Basco question. <laughs> uh, we have, I just. The question is why. Count. The count of how many, how many items or titles? Uh, we should have the, the count. Uh, let's see again. Oh, we don't have it. Uh, uh, I'm not sure I can follow up on this one. And there's another question. Yeah. What progress is being made about marking content to a central as open access? So that it can be searched using that data. How accurate do you think that data is to like a central resource is used in describing the actions of open access? I'll ask you a question back. So when you look at collections from Primo Central, you cannot identify which ones are open access and which are not? I'm asking. Usually we can, but what I'm saying is, does that, is that actually reflective of reality? We are trying. <laughs> we are trying our best. Well, you know that, that with Primo Central, we rely on the content and the metadata come, coming from vendors and publishers. Uh, yes, we are trying to market as open access as much as we can. Yes, we have uh, issues. It's not always accurate, but uh, we are trying our best. Um, any other? Well, we still got near running up again. <laughs> <laughs> just, just look at that untitled. Um, were you saying that page integration will be available in the second half? Yes. Yeah, um, I can tell you. Yeah, yeah I think it's the second half of this year. Yeah. So that's recorded now, so. <laughs> <laughs> So the next question is, we welcome the new research by Thomas Watt. We'll bring our discovery channel to incorporate more uh, more socialized and research focused discovery path for research. Mm -hmm.
that's that's me. We kind of rotate, trying to make me sound like I know things, you know. <laughs> what? No, no, I just they wrote they scripted for me, so God forbid I won't make a mistake, you know. It's like, um, so, so the answer, first of all, yes, and I think you've start, you've heard from Oren that yes, we are uh, working also uh, as part of Explore to look into how we can represent better uh, in Primo data sets and, and, and things around again, um, research object and, uh, and really allow you guys to do better things with that in Primo. It's true that I think Owen mentioned that, that we do expect to also have a, a portal like if you, uh, Owen kind of presented quickly, that is really more dedicated to research support because again, there's other things that don't flow that easily into you know a simple discovery whether it's relationships and, and other things you've seen uh, that, that existed there so the answer is yes but again it's not it doesn't mean uh, our plan is not to just use primo as is for explore uh, our plan is to still have uh, a portal is available to represent or provide uh, the access to the research and, and you know kind of allow also the university to use that Similar to you know what you a lot of universities are doing today, where they have you know whether you know other portal from from Chris system and stuff to showcase the research. So we think that's important. It can be just primo. I think it won't be as effective, but at the same time we are working as well to improve uh, the discoverability and the ability for primo to also uh, show and, and uh, you know things around research data and uh, research objects and things that would make it easier from that perspective and uh, not just publication the way it is, you know, more geared towards publication the way it's today. Any questions? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, go ahead. The next question is discovery bias. Discovery is changing rapidly and needs to be involved in the more relevant using AI and user profiling for all the users, as well as your plans in this area. And when is Primo relevancy going to be more sophisticated? So I want to I want to understand who said that Primo is not sophisticated. <laughs> <laughs> more, okay, more sophisticated. Um, so uh, it's a good question, and, and I went back to uh, to its previous headquarters. So we are not an academic institution, but we do have a research team that tries to improve uh, our sophisticated uh, engine. Um, and this team do a lot of work trying to understand and, and how trying to understand how people are using our systems. Um, I guess some of you are familiar with uh, the, the, the paper that we published two years ago about how users are searching uh, in Primo. And, and then we also uh, published another paper about how our algorithm actually works with the different types of searches, broad topic, narrow topic, and all the different uh, aspects of it and how Primo interacts with, uh, with users. So now we're continuing to, doing, uh, to do this work. Um, now, one of the interesting things that uh, I heard back from this team is that when you do research about search patterns, uh, like if you are Google, for example, you have a lot of data. Users can spend time on Google trying to find stuff. With, with Primo, we see that the sessions are much shorter. People trying to find something, either they find or they don't, then they move on. And if this user is not logged in, it's even harder to try to profile this user because you don't know what this user is actually uh, looking for and what is he. Then I had to sort of upload something. Okay. And then I muted that. And basically, what we are trying to do is first of all, yes, we're trying to profile even non logged in users based on the search words. 
So we, we can try uh, and work on big data and, 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 and basically try to look at the logs and see that if someone is searching uh, content about history of the Second World War, he's probably not learning physics. He's learning history. So we're trying to profile these kind of users as well. Um, we also have uh, some work that um, basically the trigger is Explore. So uh, with Explore, we have a data scientist. Um, I think it's in the US, but I'm not sure. Um, but basically, we're going to use a data scientist to help us try to develop new algorithms and new ways to uh, research the, the search logs and Primo Central um, search patterns. And in addition to that, we also have another project in the US together with uh, Virginia University. They have a project with the students. Again, about, what is it? It's, um, I don't have the exact name here, but similar to how to improve uh, our search engine based on how users are searching. So I hope it answers, and I hope that uh, soon our engine will be much more sophisticated and smart. <laughs> 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 Uh, and linked data. Okay, so Excellibus, uh, Excellibus looking at AI and linked data for building, not just the smarter search engine again, but um, a more customized and personalized experience which meets those criteria. Yeah, so, so basically this is a very similar to what I just answered about the research we're doing. Maybe to add on top of what I just answered, uh, I'll give you a few more um, points. So one of the things we're trying to use in our research about how users are using the system is, for example, where did they come from? For example, if this is a user that started his research or search from Leganto, we can tell to which course he's registered. So we can know what are the subjects he's interested in. The same for WebWorks. So you can start your search from WebWorks and, and then we can basically try to pick up um, these kind of uh, data elements. So, Again, as I just said for the previous answer, yes, we're trying to um, use, we are still not in the fully artificial intelligence, but yes, we're trying to work with uh, uh, big data and, and, and trying to identify patterns in the search logs. Um, and again, the work that we're doing with these professor in the US, the data scientists and the students at Virginia University are also part of the same um, initiative. So the next question is, what plans does Exilverse have for better integration between armor and finance systems? That's always an issue. Uh, so the finance data between armor and, and the ERP can be reconciled. Um, it's money to do with the actual reconciliation of funds are spent. Yeah. Um, so I just you want to open up. How many of you here are integrating your Alma with your financial system? Both ways? So basically, oh, it's too small. Um, so, so just so we're all on the same page, uh, this is how Alma interacts with the uh, financial system. So we have one direction, which is uh, basically getting the funds allocation. So Alma will have the fund information. And also, you can also see the invoices. Once they are paid, you can update Alma about paid invoices. Is this is an integration that you have, that you are using? How many of you are using this flow? Okay, so I, I guess I understand now the question. So, so um, probably this is the missing, uh, the missing piece. I'll ask in a few moments, I'll ask why. Um, but this integration, I guess you do use in updating your financial system with purchase orders and invoices, right? So this way you are doing, but not this way. Therefore, you don't have a full cycle, a full synchronization process. Um, does anyone here knows why or what issues you faced when you tried to do this kind of integration? We, we still can't 
Finance one. Anyone else using Finance One here? Oh, that was <laughs> I wanted to say that the sweet system. No, no. <laughs> but, but, but can we ask why? I mean, because again, this is the, gen, the, the integration that we do. By the way, this is, we transfer XML file. We also have allowed this to do with APIs today. We have customers today. For example, I just visited a customer that actually, they don't love it, but historically the way they worked, they actually don't work in acquisition in Alma at all. They work in their SAP system directly there. So they are full, the, the way they are, and now they are doing integration back and forth. And so they have the flexibility to, to do this, but uh, you know, the reason that I'm asking is because of the fact that, you know, if you know ERP system, every ERP system is different, and every implementation of an ERP system in a, in a university is different than the other. That's why we didn't do a, a single, you know, very specific integration with Finance One because it won't work for the different institutions here. We created generic ways, whether we transfer XML files or with APIs. Uh, so I'm kind of curious, what was it that specifically about your ERP system that didn't work? Okay. So, so again, the so you know we what we could have, we could do again is is create an XML. Obviously, yes, from that perspective, you know, depends on the type of system you have and the type of, and the way they integrate it. You might need to to uh, you know adjust the XML or convert it to a format to the exact you know fields format that will work into this. Uh, there isn't again from 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 an, an integration perspective there isn't something that I can do that is easier to, and if we think we do, then let us know. But there, you know, for us to be able to go and, and work with every ERP, and again, we have actually tried this with SAP, with Oracle. It, you know, we did with one customer, it didn't work on the second customer, it didn't work with the third customers. I think, you know, every ERP is very, very customized to your institution. So we are trying to create, that's why we're trying to do it you know, XMLs, open format, this is not our own format. You know, it's kind of easy to manipulate. APIs, you know, if you have idea, other ideas, we are, we are really open to this, but, uh, you know. I'll just yes. take yeah, the The problem, Jenny, you know the problem we have with this? Every time we say, oh, we'll just have these fields, immediately the other customer say, oh, you're, this, you're missing this field. Oh, you're missing this field. Oh, you're missing this field. <laughs> so we give them, you give you, we give you all the data. Okay, do whatever we did, but no, then you complain that, you know, there's too much data. You know, <laughs> so, but uh, I mean, we, we are looking, you know, one of the things that we know in general, you know, so we do a lot of things with XML because of the fact that, again, we can export everything and you can decide. But we know that, you know, whether, for example, this example, you know, the same with, with notice letters and stuff, you know, it, it's, you know, it's very flexible, so you can do whatever you want. But some people say, well, I wish it was more simpler and what you see is what you get kind of method. So we are thinking about, can we do something in, that has also a flavor that is more simplified than this? And this in general, not just specific for XML for exporting. This is stuff that we have actually some ideas and thumb thoughts in, in our uh, roadmap as well. Yes, yeah, we, you know, we know. Because it's such a good idea, you should put it into ideas in chat. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yes. So, Barra, I realize that it is complicated and, you know, our finance system, finance one, my place, and finance one, my place, is quite different. But, I mean, 
we do have those balanced finance funds, but it is the with the exchange rates when you you know every percent of our budget is being wasted. So it's actually getting the information back. We know in Alpha what we paid for the mm -hmm. super spot, but that is not what's paid in the our finance system. And sometimes seeing the discrepancy between Alpha and finance because of exchange rate variation. Mm -hmm. That's the complication. And trying to get that information back, you know, I think we discussed on this recently about the linking back in for getting the signals around or fund is, you know, what was the right way. So it is complicated, I realise that, but it is something that is important to us. We, we have to do a lot of monitoring with our funds outside our, you know, this is what our must-get funds was, it's what we pay. Even finding out what exchange rate it was that gives us a, a or how our money managers in exchange rate, I have no idea. You know, sometimes we're over budget because we don't have the full. So it's complicated in this region that is that is well not in Australia. Yeah. So, so I, I understand the question is complicated for the company yeah. management. Yeah, I, I think the exchange and this is I think one of the next questions. So <laughs> okay. Okay. So, kind of, we kind of we want to understand about these questions because, again, maybe we we are not getting exactly. Because, go ahead. You, know, you want to answer this? Yes. Yeah, so, so, so basically, this question is about um, exactly what you just mentioned, uh, Fiona. Um, so, in Alma, we all know that we have the exchange rates managed um, automatically from the exchange rate uh, international international bank. So, I don't, how do you call it? The, International Monetary um, Fund, whatever. Uh, and for each day uh, of the invoice, we basically assign the specific rate from the international uh, server. In addition to that, you have the option to have explicit ratio on invoices if you have your own rate. So you can do that as well. And the, uh, the exchange rate is part of the subject area in analytics. So you can always create a report with the exchange rates for each invoices or purchase orders or whatever you have. And you can also use an API to get this report outside of Alma automatically. So what, what, I'm, what, what I'm saying is that we're trying to give you the tools to handle these complicated issues. Uh, and what tools are missing? This is my question. Because in previous systems, we could see on today's exchange rate, we could go in and have this, this exchange rate, and we could match it with our finance system. So we knew that one was the one. You could do it on a daily basis. And towards the end of the financial year, it's getting crucial where you need to know that an invoice we put in for two hundred thousand dollars in our month is actually was paid in our finance system for two hundred twenty thousand or one hundred eighty or something. So it is. So it's very much. It's hard. I know we've designed that exchange rate for each invoice, but it's hard to find it on a daily basis. Interesting. Okay, well, this is good feedback. I, this is the first time I hear this because, uh, uh, you know, as, as Neil said, we, you know, we, we work hard on, on allowing, you know, people to, to uh, work both. Again, one of the things that was new in Alma was the fact that we are updating the exchanges automatically. And, and this is what's something that was requested. So, uh, if you have an example of this in, in Voyager, the way you describe it, was there actually a screen that showed the differences between? Okay, I wasn't aware of this. Okay. Uh, yeah, we'll we, take we it. We can try and take it. Okay. We can try and take We'll write it down. Okay. Okay. Please do. I, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm actually very curious. I think that's a good idea. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I can assign part to develop it. Yes, thank you. <laughs> I like getting into the needy greedy every once in a while. It's not a bad thing, even for a president. Then you wait, you can reconcile all the time. Yeah, so the functionality when it came up and now was exactly what we wanted. But now finance changed the <laughs> And in the great scheme of things, finance, what finance say. Sure, sure, we happen. agree. We agree. The, but your idea that you had, you know, from Voyager, I think is interesting. You know, Fiona, I'll, I'll sit down later and we'll talk it and we'll take it. No, this one has been moved. No, 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 this one wasn't, it wasn't me, on my side. I think this one, no, 
Yeah. This wasn't, go back, go back. We have an answer. We have an answer. Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> he took a question for that hat. I mean, I mean, I'd like to, uh, so we read this and actually that was a good idea. If we don't have it on, we didn't have it on our plan, but actually we, we, we liked that idea and we took it and, uh, you know, we'll take it uh, with the product management and see what we can do with this. So thank you for the idea. Yes. I'd like to thank you. If you have time, do you have time? If you want more questions, I mean, I don't know. I'm actually kind of disappointed because I was expecting. Uh, <laughs> so sorry, uh, Peter, you want questions? And so, and maybe this might be a question that Mosul might like to, to comment on, but I'm curious about, I'm, I was very interested to see the, the demonstration of Esploro and from the library perspective, but I'm very curious about how that engagement is happening with the research office, which will often have be the driving yay or nay part of the institution that's going to be looking at, mm -hmm. um, you know, whether a system is adopted in that sort of space. Yeah. So do you want to maybe help a little bit if I know I get a chance to think you get your perspective on this. Um, thank you for asking that question. That was a big one for us as well. Um, it's a tax relationship, um, but we brought them on board and we brought them on board with the clear indication that it's not going to happen before that because that's the biggest change that they were very well. Um, the business case for, for the, the, the reasons behind us adopting Floor back in 2011 um, was to facilitate graphical value. And as Pure has grown over time, the set out has become part of it, pieces have become part of it, and it's grown into a repository, so research data has become part of it, it's grown into a system that was designed to do something else and has been then developed and shaped into a lot of other things. And that was one of the reasons why we wanted to actively engage with Explorer because it fundamentally builds that from the very beginning. But we've also said to uh, Nadav and others and next speakers is in the long run, we want it to kill pure. <laughs> I'm being very open about this. Yeah. Uh, and the, there is a reason behind it. So pure um, is excellent at what it does for that for the world. But if that's the only thing it's doing for us, it's not providing value for money. And we can't really afford to buy multiple repository systems and pure and keep them running for multiple maintenance and still have that isolation feature between the library and the research office. But we want to really work together on this in the future. So what's not happening in Explorer yet is graph or era or anything like that. It's not to say it might not happen in the future. Yeah. And I think that's why we were keen to bring in activities, so impact case studies and those kind of things can be developed in the future. And what we've now done, and we've only just been successful in this, is to really show the future of this product in the research office. A lot of the issue was there was nothing to show before, mm. and they don't have the trust in the company in the same way we have. We, we signed the URM agreement without looking at a single screenshot of our URM at that Thank time. Thank you. Um, so we've got that trust. And not only now when they've seen the system and seen, seen some of the demos and seen some of the workers, they can appreciate how good it is from a researcher's viewpoint. They're still not fully happy with the Alma side of things because it's not something they're used to. It's a change management process for them. But I think it's over time they'll get used to that as well. And of course, wealth of partnership is to ensure that the system is ready for the market. It doesn't necessarily mean we'll adopt it. But at the moment, all the good things are happening, and it's a very strong chance that more and more people will adopt that. But that relationship is still a bit patchy. Yeah. So, if I can add to this, remember those three or uh, four circles? So, Masood will tell you that when we came about a year ago and presenting, 
you know, that section that showed what Explorer will do actually cut the Chris that's circling the bottom by half. Because initially we said, you know, we're not sure, you know, do we need to do everything on, on the crease side? Over time, as we talk to more and more customers, Sue and other, and I'm not against any product out there, but we really understood very well that, you know, it really needs to be a unified process. And that's why today we actually are talking about the fact that we are, Explorer is covering the full uh, scope of Chris. But of course we need, you know, we've, we've only worked on this now for seven months. So, uh, you know, Alma is six years and still develop with the same will happen with, with the store, but from the vision, it's the, it's the vision from day one for us. Okay. So you'll start, you'll see more and more as we evolve, how we are engaging more, uh, on the side of, of, so that, you know, more important for the research office. The interesting thing though, is also the fact that when we talk to a lot of research offices, they actually really don't mind that library will lead uh, this. And I think you see this in Australia. We see a transition where maybe, you know, the, Chris was, was uh, owned or, you know, bought initially by the, by the research office and now is moving to the library. We've seen this happening, you know, in Australia. We see this happening in the UK. Less in the US yet, but I think it is a trend because of the fact you know, they don't have people that understand it. They don't have staff that can manage the system. They rely many times on, on librarians to do this. So they actually want to be part of it, but don't mind the library leading or owning this. Uh, so I think it's going to help in that perspective. So you move into the library, I think it's a good thing. Um, at, at least from my perspective, I hope so as well from yours. But so I think it's the right direction. We, we, are, we are focusing a lot right now on library and researchers as my said, because I think for us, you know, the success will be to change, to do a part of, you know, change what institutional repositories were today, which are not very successful because of, you know, that. So we don't focus on, on the research office right now in the early stage, but we will definitely as part of, of the overall uh, product a little bit down the road. Yeah. As someone who was doing the GDPR contracts for the library and the institution, I want to say thank you to Sligas. We were okay. one of the few companies out of the 40 plus contracts that we had to be to actually work proactive. Thank you. Everyone else, we had to say you need to add these things. You already have this. Thank you. So someone who thank was you. right at the heart of thank it. You. Thank, thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you. We work very hard with GDPR. I can tell you that. You guys are very lucky that you. I hope, is there anyone here that has compasses in Europe, by the way? Oh, you are lucky. <laughs> it's a big deal to thank you, Masood. Thank you. Any other questions? Oh, okay. thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so, once again, thank you guys. Thank you. Uh,